What is up, everybody? Welcome to Roll for Persuasion. I'm Andrew Richardson. This is my show. Thank you so much for listening, for joining me. It is always exciting to do one of these episodes. I look forward to it every week. Basically, if you've never listened to the show before, I go out and I talk to awesome people in the D&D and tabletop community about the cool things they're doing, about how their games influence, inspire, and impact the work that they're doing. And I share that with you guys. It's a pretty straightforward gig, and I really enjoy it. And what I really enjoy most is talking with all of you. I appreciate all of the people on Twitter and Instagram who reach out and just like to chat. If you ever want to email me directly, my email is andrew at rollforpersuasion.com. Feel free to drop me a line. And you can always follow on social, both Twitter and Instagram, at rollpersuasion. Um, always love interacting with people on there. We also have a Patreon. If you want to support the show, it's patreon.com slash rollforpersuasion. There's a level there that lets you submit questions for guests that we have coming up. And it's always exciting to, like I said, hear from you guys. And more than anything, I appreciate your reviews. Uh, I've been getting a lot of awesome reviews on Apple Podcasts lately and Podchaser and all the different areas. And it's kind of, you know, it's kind of hard to believe sometimes when you put yourself out into the world that people would enjoy what you're doing. But for some reason, you guys do. And so I appreciate it. And I appreciate your kind words. So if you have the time, definitely leave us a review. We appreciate that. Um, It definitely helps support the show so that I can keep talking to awesome people about the cool things that they are doing. Speaking of awesome people, I have one of them with me here today, and I'm very excited to talk with her. Dr. Megan, what is going on? Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I I appreciate appreciate you coming on. Uh, Dr. Megan Connell, you are a doctor of psychology, is that correct? Yes, yep. And, And you do a lot of work in the gaming space give just like a quick overview uh what all and, and you showed me earlier you have a list but like what all do you do like in a i natural. forget all that i do i'm a board certified psychologist first i have a private practice in charlotte north carolina where i work at southeast psych it's like the premier geek therapy practice in the country. I'm also the co-founder of a company called Geeks Like Us, where we celebrate all things geeky and all passions around geekdom. I'm the uh, host and producer of Psychology at the Table. It's a YouTube series that I do about how to be more accommodating at your table for people with anxiety, depression, learning disabilities, different challenges. Um, We're also talking now about a little bit about how the brain works and how that impacts us. I'm also the Dungeon Master of Clinical Role, which is a a live streamed game on Twitch where all of my players are therapeutic dungeon masters and other psychologists. Um, And then I am also a therapeutic dungeon master and get to talk about that. I run three different D&D groups where I use D&D to help teach empowerment and social skills to girls. So what you're saying is you just have a lot of free time. Like so much so free much time. Free I'm time. also like been writing book chapters and working oh on writing gosh. my own book too. And I have kids. <laughs> and yeah, so just you know, things on things on things. Um, that is awesome, and, and I'm looking forward to getting into each of those. But you know, let's kind of like let's go all the way back. When did you mm-hmm. get into gaming and really like D and D specifically? Kind of when did that happen for you? So D and D, I think for like most people, like starts in middle school, right? Um, so I am old and, uh, when I was started playing D and D, this was before computers were really common. Sure. And so character sheets were written on notebook paper and written down the columns Do and tell. filling everything out. Um, yeah. only one of my friends had a book and we just had to rely on them to tell us what we were doing. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it was just a lot of fun. It was us sitting around a table being goofy with each other. Um, I created, I was really into Lord of the Rings at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there were a lot of Elven Rangers and right. the character classes I was building. Um, but I just loved the invention of it. Uh, I went, the people I went to middle school with were some of the most amazing people I've ever gotten to yeah. know and super duper creative and hilarious. Um, and one of my favorite things that we would do is make up spells. Yeah. And uh, so one of my friends came up with a spam spell. Okay. It was a transmutation spell that if it reduced the target to zero hit points, uh, you rolled a D6 and that's how many rations of food the person turned into. <laughs> that's awesome. So, so it would, you know, do damage and then the right. person would become a pile of spam. Right. Uh, that, <laughs> we that were gives very into Monty Python. Great potential for like fried spam moments and uh, all sorts of. <laughs> yes. Oh, it was great. Yeah. Um, but it, it was just a lot of us 
goofing off. Um, we sure. all live, re- I, I grew up in Maine. And uh, so okay. living not too far from somebody in Maine means you're about 45 minutes away. <laughs> okay, sure. So all my friends were far away. Right. Um, so it, we didn't get to play all that often, but when we did, it was just great. And it was a lot of fun. Um, fell away from the hobby uh, during high school and college. And then uh, got into computer role-playing games and they reminded me so much of playing D and how much right, I enjoyed yeah. it. Uh, and then what started really getting me back into it was uh, I watched uh, Will Wheaton's um, Titan's Grave, Ash- Ashes yeah, of Alcada, yeah. right? I'm saying that right. Um, and just seeing that and seeing them play and role play around the table, I was like, oh man, I, I remember this. And so we yeah, actually yeah. got um, the fantasy age system mm-hmm. and I played that with my family. But we wanted a little bit more customizability and we wanted a little bit more, it, that, that system is really great and streamlined, Sure. Um, but it just wasn't fitting what we wanted. So we bought the starter set, then we started playing, then we bought the player's handbook, um, ran the Lost Minds of Fandelver, and then I jumped into a weekly campaign um, and it was so much fun. Uh, and like the yeah. weekly campaign I joined, it was a group of random people on Roll20 and we've now been playing together for almost four years. Oh, wow. That's yeah. pretty cool. That's pretty cool. It's kind of interesting. I feel like um, a lot of people that I talk to who got into the game early, I didn't. I only I only got into it about three years ago. I'm I'm 30, so mm-hmm. fairly recently. Um, but but kind of similar to you, like loved Lord of the Rings and and you know just kind of nerdy stuff growing up, and just never knew it was an option. But a mm-hmm. lot of people that I talk to who who played early on kind of have that same thing. They're like, oh, I kind of fell off you know, middle school, high school, and then, you know, 5e around that time, like pick back up and like, and then they've just been going like all in ever since. And so it's kind of interesting. Like the more people I talk to, that's kind of a recurring theme of they've mm-hmm. kind of come back to the game. And, and it's, it's kind of cool that it has that ability to kind of transcend your own like um, times in your life, right? Different, different periods and kind of eras of your own life and then kind of come back in out of childhood into adulthood, you know? Most definitely. And one of the things that 5e has done so well, and is the thing they did intentionally was to make it easy to pick back up. Sure. Yeah. You know, I, I think I had thought a little bit about D&D again and f- with 4e and I read a little bit about it and I was just like, wow, this seems really complicated. And I was in grad school at the time. So I was like, okay, now. Um, but then like uh, we started watching a uh, critical role as well. Yeah. And seeing them play and just going, Oh my God, yes, this was so much fun. And this is what I want to do. And just understanding the rules through watching them and watching them play. Like it became wonderful. Yeah. It's definitely, I, I think very approachable and certainly from, from people that I've talked to, um, I didn't play for you, but that I've talked to, they're like, Oh yeah, infinitely more approachable, significantly less math, um, much easier to play. So, so you've got kind of who you are now, Dr. Megan, you're the, you're the, the, mm-hmm the D and D psychologist. Right. Um, so when did that kind of convergence happen? At what point did you kind of go, okay, you know what, what I'm doing clinically connects with what happens at the table. When did that kind of convergence happen? There was an aha moment when I was cleaning my house. Uh, so we have been playing our Sunday campaign for three or four months at this point. And, uh, being a psychologist, I let my brain wander and go, okay, the character I played for Fandelver and then the character I'm playing now both came from my brain. They seem very different, but they came from my brain. So there has to be some commonalities between them. And what are sure. they? And when I realized what they were, it hit me. I was like, oh, this is my central issue. This is the big <laughs> thing I need to work on. Yeah. And there was that moment of like feeling, you know, very vulnerable when you realize something that you have to work on about yourself. But then yeah. uh, there was immediately this other realization of like, this would have taken me years of therapy to get to. For and sure, yeah. Wow, how cool that I was able to get to it in a couple months of just playing a game. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, that's too powerful of a tool not to use therapeutically. And so right. I started really having that idea percolate in my mind of like, how can I use D and D in therapy? What what would this look like? Um, and I had an incredibly long commute at the time, and so I listened to the Dragon Talk podcast a lot on my commute, and I happened to hear um, Dr. Bocanzaro or Dr. B from Take This on there, and he was mm-hmm. talking about the groups that they were running out of aspiring youth in Seattle, and uh, connected with him and started kind of uh, launching my group based off of conversations we had, um, doing my own thing because the model they use is a little or 
used then is a little different than the, what I'm doing. Um, but uh, through him also got to know uh, Adam and Adam of then Wheelhouse Workshop, but now Game to Grow. Sure. And so we started building this little community and um, that kind of launches into how clinical role came about, which was um, everybody else doing therapeutic D&D that I knew of at the time lived in Seattle and I was in Charlotte, North Carolina. A little bit of a distance there. A little bit of a distance. Sure. And I really wanted us all to connect. That having a peer group is incredibly important to bounce ideas off of and right, to get support. Right. Um, and especially like from the psychological standpoint, when you're doing something new, there's a huge risk in it sure. because we have to take into account the ethics of what we're doing and making sure that we're being intentional with the risks that we're taking and we're thinking through all the potential consequences. Right. And so having that group of peers to bounce ideas off of is incredibly important. But who the heck wants another meeting? <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Sure. Sure. And so while it probably would have been awesome for us all to schedule, you know, once a month sitting down and just talking cases and chit chatting, we all would find excuses to back out of that. Right. It would have become low priority. So I was like, well, we're all dungeon masters. And I know something about dungeon masters is we never get to play. Right. And yeah, I also true. know something about psychologists and therapists is we're typically terrible at self-care. Also. So true. let's play a game together. And give us all time to unplug from our clinical lives and just engage with one another at the table. And then we also decided to stream the game because that also gave us another le level of accountability to encourage right, us yeah. to show up. For sure. Um, and so it's been really fun. And so through playing D and D, we've built these really super strong friendships um, across the country, where we have this wonderful network where we all can now bounce the ideas off of each other and talk to each other. Right. So you, you mentioned with your own kind of like revelation, if you will, self-realization um, that you were able to do some stuff like with your character at the table that kind of got to mm -hmm. some, some personal issues or the core of, you know, some stuff that you might not have been able to as quickly. Otherwise, w w what do you think it is about the role playing, the interacting with other people at the table? What, what do you think it is that kind of might allow that connection for people that they might not be able to make in their everyday life? Um, what is it the disconnect from, you know, the fact that they're in a fantasy, like, like what, what, what do you think it is that allows yeah, that? I think the disconnect is a big part of it because it's sure. not me. It's my character. Right. Right. And so if my character fails at this, that's not on me. It's yeah. them. They yeah. didn't know what they were doing and that's why it happened. It's not because I don't know how to do this thing. Right. Right. Sure. Um, and so I think that's one of the pieces of it, but like the other is because it's not us, because it is that a distance of that's my character doing the thing. I think it enables us to take risks more. Sure. Yeah. It allows us to try things out and to see what would work um, in a way where we don't feel defensive. Um, one of the things I'm also really fascinated by is how insightful comedy can be to us mm -hmm. that I, I think most of us have had an experience when you watch stand-up comedy, like the comedian will say something, you're like, I feel seen. <laughs> right? right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not alone. But in a way, yeah, yeah. But in a way where you're like, you're now laughing at yourself and like comedy has this wonderful way to get past all of our defenses and to kind of help us go, Oh God. Yeah, I do do that. Wow. Um, and, and I think role-playing has a very similar way of kind of getting under our skin and getting yeah. to the heart of the matter in a way that feels safe for us. For sure. Um, how, how then I, I'm, I'm thinking, so let me back up <laughs> historically. Um, I, the D and D community has been somewhat dominated by certain groups of people, right? Mm -hmm. White, white dudes. Um, yep. right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and even now there's still, you know, if you're, if you're active online at all, which, which I know you are, you still see a lot of, of pushback and, and, you know, non-inclusive mindset or whatnot coming from a lot of people um, around the game. How, if, if, if you are introducing this maybe to someone in a, in a therapeutic setting or something, how do you kind of overcome that stigma that people might have of this idea of like, oh, well, that's like for, you know, ang angry, you know, white dudes who are rolling <laughs> dice somewhere and like want to have control and, you know, aggression and all that well, stuff. How, how do you kind of frame it? Right. Interestingly, I haven't come across that yet. 
Okay. And when I was like really doing my, you know, trying to work on my elevator pitch, which I still haven't mastered, um, it, it was like one of those things of like, okay, how do I respond when people say, well, I think this is just something for, you know, middle-aged white dudes. And yeah. like, no, it's pretend play. Like, and cause my groups are all girl Okay. in a, in the Bible belt. Let's add that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, it, but you know, for me, it's sitting down going, this is pretend play. This is what girls do all the time when they're yeah. younger, you know, and if you look, girls love fantasy. They love, you know, I know I'm speaking in gross over generalizations for gender here. Sure. I acknowledge that. No and I, I do hate doing it, but like, it, it's a thing we say, like, you know, there's this love of fan fiction and yeah. doing a deep dive into things and like you know, fantasizing about what is it like to be this person or that person. And so what it's really doing is giving a, an outlet where we can engage in fantasy, but in a way that connects us and brings us together rather than isolates us in our own heads. And so it has that beautiful ability to do this. And how I pitch this for girls specifically is talking about how women treat each other in our culture. Um, and I'm bringing up culture because I think it's important. I don't think how we're taught to treat each other is a thing of the biology of being female, I think sure. is cultural influences. And like, we know women tend to be terrible to each other. Um, there was a study that was published, oh gosh, about a year, year and a half ago, uh, talking about negative evaluations of women and other women tend to be meaner than men towards women, Yeah, which is really significant. And, um, you know, so we, we need to learn how to support one another. And so that's one of the, my goals of the group is to create strong, supportive friendships where girls feel like they're part of a team. They're not feeling like they have to compete with one another for finite resources. There's plenty for all and that they all can have a piece of the fun and a piece of the spotlight and enjoy themselves. That's awesome. So how do you, uh, you mentioned that you, you DM uh, several different games and as a DM, how do you foster that during the game? Do you kind of have intentional um, ways of engaging? Do you keep it all kind of within the the meta of the game? Like, mm -hmm. or do you, do you know, do you say, Hey, time out, you know, we're going to have some processing time. Like, let's, let's talk yeah. through that. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of both. Um, sure. we do processing time. Um, and we do talk about it and you know, I'll put the DM screen down and like, there's a <laughs> two different processing times. Um, one of them is emotions have gotten high around the table and we need to contain it and help everyone yeah, process through yeah. it and work through it. The other time is Dr. Megan's lesson time <laughs> where I'm like, all right, this is a therapy group. Right. It's lesson time. And I, I get like the lovely eye rolls, which I expect at that point. Sure. Um, you know, and uh, it, it is that implicit and explicit kind of walking that fine balance. Um, it, there's a couple of different techniques that I use to do this. Um, one of them is letting the group fail Sure. And then I use, I, so another thing that I have done was I was in the army for seven years and awesome. in the military, you have something called the AAR, the after action review, mm -hmm. where you talk about the things that went well, the things that didn't go so well, and then what you're going to change going forward. Right. And so if they're not planning, they're not listening to each other, they're not supporting one another, they're going to go into a combat situation and not do very well. Yeah. You know, there's a really yeah. good chance you know, someone's going to end up at zero hit points because I um, let the group members stay at the level that they're at if they come back into the group. Mm -hmm. And so you start off at level two, no matter what. And so I have level two and level three characters in a group with level 10 characters. Oh, wow. And so there's a really big discrepancy in the yeah. abilities. Um, but I do that intentionally because a lot of my players are new and I don't want to overwhelm them with giving them sure, here's your sure. level 10 character and all the things, you know, like, they can do a few things. That's it. Um, and so when we break it down, when things don't go well, it's like, okay, what didn't go well? What were the problems here? Yeah. Um, I just had a group, we did this last week and they were talking about how two of them just decided to go rushing in mm -hmm. to this and got captured. And so they were saying, well, like we were having to react rather than planning and being proactive. And that that sucked because we didn't have right. the power. We didn't know what was going on. And so talking about like that idea of slowing down and trusting one another enough to talk about your plan and talk about what you want to do. Right. So what are the differences then? I mean, 
at, at basic levels, like in therapy, you, you will have often have like one-on-one, right? Like individual mm-hmm. therapy and you'll have like a group therapy setting. And mm-hmm. so now you're kind of taking group therapy and then you're putting, you know, this framework about, around it. W- yeah. what, what do you think like uniquely, not just about D&D, but about that kind of group setting, what kind of like unique opportunities are there in that setting that let you, you know, connect with people or, or kind of like make breakthroughs or, or do therapy well in that context? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think one of the big things is group therapy itself. Um, research on group therapy is amazing. It is minute for minute of therapy more effective for almost all diagnoses than individual therapy. The problem is, is you can't get people to go to group therapy, (laughs) right? Also insurance tends not to pay for group therapy, which creates another humongous problem that let's not talk about that one. Um, (laughs) That's a bag of worms. My my Uh, wife did, my wife did group therapy at a hospital for a while. And she was like, the great thing about it is everyone has to go like it's inpatient. There's no, there's no, there's no choice. Yeah. Yeah. They they make great breakthroughs. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, we're all alone in our own heads sure. and it feels scary to be all alone in our heads. And we all have this very deep seated fear that what if I don't fit in with everybody else? Um, And we can kind of go into the psychology of that. Like that's actually like just a biological fear that we have because humans alone in the time when we became humans did not survive. We needed the collective. We needed everybody around us to help keep us safe. Um, and when you're with a group of people that are like you, it takes away that fear that there's something broken, something wrong in you. Yeah. And you have that genuine connection with another person. You can feel seen, you can feel connected, you can feel accepted for being yourself. And so that's like one of the biggest powers in group therapy is that safety and being around everybody to feel connected and to feel seen. Um, and so in a lot of ways, the group itself can be healing. You know, like I I say this a lot when I talk about my groups is like, I just, I adore the girls who are in it and it's a changing cast of characters. Mm -hmm. um, hmm, I should actually probably know the number of people I've seen in my (laughs) groups, but I don't off the top of my head. Um, You know, but I'll never forget. There was uh, a girl in one of my groups who had this whole script inside of her head of nobody wants me around. Nobody likes me. I have no friends and had kind of created this loner character who the edgy character, right? Right. Um, Hot topic, you know, hanging. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yeah. But like the group did this beautiful thing where in character, they would role play and say like, okay, yeah, we're, we understand your character wants to be left alone. But then being out of character, checking in with her and be like, we want you to know we want her as part of the group, but we're trying to respect her boundaries. Yeah. You know, so they would do, you know, she would say things like, oh, my character is going to go off and be by themselves. And then someone else would say, okay, well, I'm going to have my character go sit and just kind of keep an eye out. Yeah. And watch. And through the 10 weeks or so of that group, she started to trust a little bit more and build that confidence. Um, And then we went into our summer session and she said she wasn't coming to the summer session. And then we get to the first session and I didn't even know she was coming. She walked in the door right after we had started a group and everybody around the table cheered. Oh, that's awesome. It was, you could just, you know, it's really cool when you can see moments of change and growth in people Yeah. Yeah. and just seeing this moment where she was confronted with a genuine, spontaneous, positive response from people wanting her to be around. Right. It completely went contrary to that script in her head. Um, it was just so amazing and wonderful to see for her. Yeah. I mean, uh, you saying that right now, just, I mean, it makes a, it makes kind of a great point that D and D because it's narrative, right. You know, my character goes mm-hmm. and kind of keeps an eye. Um, it can help defeat some of those false stories that we play in our heads, right? Like I go off alone, no one's going to come and no one cares about me. So no one's going to come check up on me, even though someone in real life might be like, Oh, I'm worried about that person. I'm keeping an eye on them in the game because you're narrating that you're able to explicitly tell someone like, no, my, my person, my character, myself cares about you. And this is how they're actively caring about you. And, and you can narrate some of those thought processes that you might, or that you just straight wouldn't in normal interaction. Right. And so Mm -hmm. you can kind of break through some of those negative self-talk and and negative stories that people might have. Like, like that, that's gotta be awesome. Like you were saying to see 
that happen in that group setting, like of people's free will, right? Reaching out to each other. Yeah, yeah, it, it's so amazing. And just it, the girls who have been in the group for a while, like are very just accepting and loving of each other and just get so excited about everything that they do. Um, yeah. And just, it, I, they're just, ah, they're wonderful. I, I, I can kind of go on and on about it, but it's just so cool to get to witness the growth that they have. And that's the cool part of being a group therapist is to watch, you know, it's essentially to go hands off and trust in the process of the group yeah. to help one another. Yeah. And to see that come around and to see people rise and step into leadership roles and to step into those stronger friendship roles. It's really incredible to see. Yeah. So how then do you, you're creating a cool game where people mm -hmm. are, are feeling loved and accepted maybe for the first time, you know, they're, they're creating bonds because they're processing, you know, trauma and, and negativity and all the stuff that they've dealt with. How do you then discharge someone from like an awesome story, right? Like, mm -hmm. like in a group, you could be like, Oh, like, like you're done in here. We're discharged. But like, like, how do you handle that? Like, oh, we're in the middle of an awesome story. We just fought a dragon. Like, like yeah, do people yeah. perpetually stay in the group or do they kind of evolve out they, over time? They cycle in and out. So um, I try to frame the groups to be about 10 weeks long. Okay. And I use this, um, when I started the group off, I, let's see, I've gone through a few different iterations. The first round, I was having them follow a module. Um, because yeah. I was still new enough in my DMing that I didn't want to homebrew and have to think about all of that. Sure. Um, then I moved into a homebrew campaign setting where I had an overarching plot that was going to take a couple of years. Yeah. And so people could come in and out. Um, and that went pretty well. Like that went really, really well. I'd like to do something like that again. Um, but what I've been doing for about a year now is a system developed by Adam and Adam of Game to Grow where they call it the rumor system. Okay. Um, where you draw a very bad map and okay. well, you do the start of a map and then you have each group member add a feature to the map. Okay. Then you start naming things on the map and then you start creating stories about the map and rumors. Yeah. And, okay. And then the group gets to vote on the rumors that they want to explore. And then you create a story around that and then try to think about the therapeutic goals that you have for the person and weave that into those story beats as well. Okay. That's, um, that's really cool. Yeah. Like, yeah it's like, a lot of fun. And so it, in that way though, I'm usually able to wrap it up nicely at the 10 weeks. Sure, so you, sure. We have a pizza party at the end of our sessions. And so, um, usually how the story ends is like, we're having a party Yeah. and then the next session starts and the people who aren't there, um, their characters got letters or something and right, right. left the party and the players who remain are now given this epic quest that ha takes place in this completely different land and they are teleported to this new land yeah and have to go <laughs> you know explore right um, right i love one of my groups that came up with uh, these floating islands and they decided to call it sky texas <laughs> <laughs> and the rumor they made is just sky texas is a mess <laughs> Well, as, as, someone, as someone who lives in land, Texas, I mean, they're not that far off. So Yeah, <laughs> it was great. It was like, you know, oh, we're in Sky, Texas. This place right. is, this is terrible. <laughs> Why are we here? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So, so you, you do your groups. You also, mm -hmm. um, you've been involved in, you know, some, some fairly like high profile, you know, events and, and whatnot in the mm -hmm. community. You've done stuff with Geek and Sundry. You've done stuff with, um, with various different groups and cons, how did, how did the more kind of public facing part of what you've been doing, how did that kind of come around and, and develop initially? Um, really, it's been just about building relationships. I, I wish I had a, a like Classic a 10 point, answer. you know, a 10 point strategy. It, um, I tend, I try as much as possible just to be a genuine yeah. person and getting to know people. And I have a lot of fun on Twitter yeah, I know a lot of people say Twitter is like the worst place on the internet, but like you customize your feed by who you follow. Right. Yeah. yeah. And if you're only following people who are doing fun, amazing things and like, you know, awesome cosplays and talking about, you know, cool campaign settings and fun stuff, you have a pretty fun feed. Yes. It's a very skewed view of the world and you're not getting the whole picture, but that's not what I go to Twitter for. Right. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, it was just uh, interacting with people and I, um, it just kind of randomly responded to a tweet Satine had about 
uh, trauma and understanding the trauma brain, because as I said, I was in the military. And so I specialize in treating PTSD. Yeah. And uh, she and I had a lovely conversation. And then uh, shortly after she invited me to be on GM tips and that. So it was just, it was building relationships, you know? yeah. <laughs> plain and simple. Have you had a lot of people, um, you, you stream your game, like you said, your, mm-hmm. your clinical role. Um, have you had a lot of people reach out to you about that who've, who've connected with what you're doing or who've you know, been inspired or, or you know, moved by, by something you guys are doing in the game? Uh, not so much in uh, clinical roles in the game, but just in general, yeah. like the stuff I'm doing. I, I get probably now two to three emails a week. Yeah from people who, and the, my favorite ones, please keep them coming. People are grad students who are wanting to do research around tabletop role play games because there is so little to almost none being done. Um, trying to connect the people who are doing research and getting people to do research is so important. Yeah. Um, so I love getting those emails. I've gotten emails from people in Australia, from in France, um, England, and then all across the States and Canada as well. Yeah. Um, so I, I love it. Keep them coming. Like uh, I like trying to help people and answer questions about this and just spread the word of like what a powerful tool this is. Yeah. Um, you know, I had mentioned earlier that girls in Western culture tend not to be supportive of one another. And when I realized that the, my groups had moved past proof of concept was I had a parent meeting with um, a dad of one of the girls in mm-hmm. my groups. And he said, you know, I see her with her school friends and I see her with her D and D friends. He's like, with her school friends, there's a lot of backhanded compliments and just really mean and snarky remarks to yeah. each other. Yeah. He's like, I don't see that with her D and D friends. They are genuinely enjoying each other's company. When they say they like something, they just say it because they like it. They are friendly. She is so much more relaxed around them. Like that, whatever this is, is wonderful. Yeah. And I want, He's like, I just really want her just to hang out with her D and D friends. <laughs> right, right. What What do you think the secret is then? To this is a very big question, so feel free oh, to pass boy. on it. But like, <laughs> what what is what is the secret then to taking that safety off the table and into life, into society? Like you talked about, how it's not it's not biological, right? The the girls, you know, treat each other that way. It's not, you know, toxic masculinity isn't biological, it's culture, right? It's, it's mm-hmm. an awful self-perpetuating like cycle. How do we break it? How can we specifically use what we're doing in the games to, to interact better with each other in life, right? Honestly, I think a big part of it is playing. Um, Chris Perkins was quoted as saying this, and I, also Adam Davis will say he said it first, so I'm not sure who said it first, but sure. uh, just that if everybody played D and D, the world would be a better place. Yeah. Like, and I think the key there is empathy. Mm-hmm. You know, we build empathy by learning to really figure out what it's like to be in somebody else's shoes, and understanding like what it's like to be in those character shoes, to be at a point where you're you feel hopeless and to come back from that to feel rescued by your friends um to feel connected and to be part of a group that's doing something important in the world you know those moments can be very powerful for us and can really give us a different experience you know it's, it's um this really wonderful thing that happens when we're telling D &D stories Mm -hmm. You know, like if you and I were in a campaign together yeah, and we had had some sort of epic battle against, um, you know, a troll king, let's say. And two years later, we randomly run into each other and we start talking about that epic battle. We're going to use the phrasing of, do you remember when we did fought that troll king? Right. And you slid in with your arrows and we're firing off and I got that one spell in that got him held in place, right? Yeah, yeah. We're not saying my character or your character. We're saying us. Right. Yeah. It's like an experience that happened to us. Yeah. And there's something very powerful in that. Yeah. You know, I, I yeah. think our media today, it's problematic. Sure. To, I'll be diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> um, and not in the way that maybe people are expecting that I'm going to say, but because most of the media that we consume has to do with national and international problems. Right. Well, international and national problems are important. 
we as individuals have very little ability to impact them. Right. When we can focus on the news of our city, our county, even our neighborhood, Mm -hmm. we can actually change that stuff. Yeah. Like our power to change that stuff is, is there. Yeah. But with the way our media is focused, you don't sell many papers talking about the local mayor's new policy about school lunches or something. Right. Yeah. But talking about the horrible thing that's happening in Syria is going to sell more papers. Sure. And so like, we, I think, walk around these days feeling really powerless yeah. because we're just inundated with all this information about stuff that we can't do anything about. And playing a game like D&D, it gives us a chance to become powerful enough in that world to influence change. Right. And I think that ability to see ourselves as being powerful, as being able to change the world can help us step out and do things a little differently. Yeah. To say like, I'm going to see us as a party that works together rather than competitors that have to work against each other. Yeah. You know, and I think there's something very powerful in that. And isn't it interesting too, that, that in these games we play, right? We, we have these big epic scenarios. We have the, you know, dragons that are battled and, you know, evil gods that are coming back to destroy the world. But, but so often what ends up happening in so many of our games is, is, moments of those smaller moments like Mm -hmm. how are we going to rescue this this npc that we encountered this person that we encountered my my group just played through water deep dragon heist and my character um no no spoilers to the game was far less concerned with defeating the big evil bad guy and more about like how do i rescue these two kids that i interacted with early on Mm -hmm. and and it's it's interesting kind of in light of what you're saying like like you said we're overwhelmed in life with with news and with media and with stories about things that are bigger than us that we don't feel like we have any control or any agency over. And then we get into a world where we, in theory, our characters have agency and control over these big dramatic things. Yet we often still choose then to focus on the smaller personal, you know, interpersonal and engaged moments. Even, you know, yeah, we might fight the dragon, but we still take advantage of those opportunities. We create those opportunities for ourselves. It's, it's just mm-hmm. really interesting that we, we choose to do that. Um, even though we still have the power to, go throw fireballs at a troll king, right? Yes, yeah. And and there's just, it's wonderful to see that connection and that caring. Like um, I had the uh, privilege of getting to GM a table locally for uh, Jasper's game day. Okay. Uh, And the module is called uh, Tortle Trouble, I believe. And uh, I tore this little module, like the first character, the NPC who's sort of their quest giver and goes along with the party Mm -hmm. is this old turtle named Sonny who just thinks everybody's wonderful yeah (laughs) and nobody ever means anything bad yeah and just is completely trusting and I um had a table of all teenage boys and one dad okay and so I'm like oh boy I hope they like Sonny (laughs) within two minutes of role playing with Sonny one of the boys like stood up and looked around he's like guys no matter what else we do, Sonny has to live. <laughs> That's, okay, we're good. You're like, cool. We're good. We're good. Oh, thank we're good. goodness. We're good. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it is. It's like that thing of like, maybe I can't control what's going on at school. I can't control how I'm feeling at work, you know, the, the new horrible policy at work or whatever. Right, right. But I have some ability to control if this turtle lives or dies. Yeah. And I want to feel good and I want to feel heroic and I want to help them live. I want to help them survive. Yeah. So here you are, you're doing all this awesome stuff. 10 years from now, what, what are, what are you hoping to be doing? Are you still wanting to be doing groups? Do you have kind of like big things mm-hmm. in mind that you're hoping to grow or build? What, what, what does that look like down the road? Um, definitely want to keep doing the groups because I love them and sure. it's so much fun. And I think one of the important things as a therapist too, is that you enjoy what you do and that you get joy out of it. And um, it's just so much fun to see these girls grow. I hope, you know, I've uh, recently gotten to co-author a training with Dr. B. So he and I are working together on um, this training and we're actually going to be offering it again via uh, a webinar through uh, Leyline's Geek Therapy in April, I think 
is when we're doing it, yeah. where we're training more people on the applied use of tabletop role playing games. I'd love to see it continue to grow and to yeah. be awesome. Love to see more research being done. Sure, I don't want yeah. to do the research. <laughs> right. like, I will help. I will gather data from my yeah. groups, from yeah, yeah. people as long as we get through the IRB. Don't make me do a statistical analysis. <laughs> right, right. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I want to continue doing that stuff and just to, this sounds super cheesy, but you know, I want to make the world a better place and the way yeah. I'm choosing to make it better is by getting more people to play Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't think it's cheesy at all. I, th I think so many of us have the thought of, I want to make the world a better place and then we stop there because mm -hmm. like you said before, we don't always feel like we have the power to make it a better place. But when we realize that if we use our gifts and our abilities and our passions to impact our immediate circle that we really can't have that change right so it's not it's not it's not cheesy at all right it's it it's genuinely genuinely having an impact yeah it's, it it is just so much fun and when we can get people sitting down at a table together you know rolling dice telling a story yeah. laughing you know and just being in the moment um the style of therapy i do one of the big parts of it is learning how to be present learning how to be in the here and now yeah and that is such an important part of role-playing games is if you're not focusing on what's going on, you might miss big clues, but you also will miss opportunities to connect and to have those amazing moments with your character. Right. That's awesome. Um, thanks so much for talking. Where, where can people find you in the next year? Do you have conventions coming mm -hmm. up or, or, you know, are you can be out yes. there where people can meet you out in person? Yeah, I will be at PAX Unplugged here in a few weeks. Um, then, I'm going to do a convention in the spring. I'm not entirely sure which one. Yeah. Um, possibly PAX East, possibly Gary Con. Most definitely will be back at Game Hole Con next year um, in 2020. That's my favorite convention Everyone that I go to. Everyone says a Game Hole Con was awesome. And I'm so upset oh I didn't gosh. go. I'm like, I have to go next year. I can never you go to Gary to Con because it's always on my daughter's birthday. But Game mm -hmm. Hole, everyone says Game Hole's great. Game Hole is so relaxed and so much fun. Like you can actually sit and play. You can just talk with people. Um, PAX conventions are amazing and an adrenaline rush, but like, if you actually want to have a conversation with people, PAX is not the place to do it. It's just, yeah. just go, 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 go. Yeah. And so much to see, so much to do. It's wonderful. I love going to PAX. I love, you know, PAX West, PAX East, PAX, uh, I haven't been to South yet. So South I is think, where I go. So, you know, yeah. come on down yep. sometime. I might, that might be one of the ones I go to. It's up in the air. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, I do those events. I'm going to be continuing to do Psych at the Table. Um, the production has come to a screeching halt on those just because I've got a lot of writing projects. I'm a very slow writer. And so that's kind of take, I have people being like, hey, you have a deadline you have to hit with this writing. Yeah, and yeah. so it's like, okay, editing a video is a really, really low priority. Sure, sure. Um, I also have recently started a podcast with a couple of other psychologists called Brain Noodles. Okay. Um, and uh, it's not specifically a D&D &D podcast. We just talk about whatever's going on in our minds. Yeah. No, it's <laughs> kind of cool. I like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, it was a thing of, of we wanted to build better friendships and relationships with each right, other. And so right. we we're like, well, let's, we all are super overachievers. So let's turn it into work. Right. <laughs> so, so therefore, um, we actually do it. Yeah. Uh, so that's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I have a couple of like some book chapters coming out this year and then I'm around. I'm always on yeah. Twitter, Megan Sidey on Twitter. That's at, at, or at Megan Sidey. That's how you find me. Um, on there like right now i'm enjoying the fact i did a craft over the weekend that okay. people are enjoying greatly i made a little like uh r and r recovery room for my dice when they're not rolling i saw well. that i saw that today it was awesome <laughs> yes <laughs> instead of putting them in jail right like give them instead a, of putting yeah. them in jail we, we put them into rehabilitation and we yeah, talk about yeah. you know performance anxiety and there's right. motivational posters and things so. <laughs> you, need, you need to put like the little the little cat poster like the keep hanging on right like yes the cat yeah the power line. yeah <laughs> I was trying to make an exercise wheel too, to getting a little OT in there, but I couldn't right. quite figure it out. The whole thing's made out of cardboard. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I love doing silly things. And I've recently taken up mini painting. I'm not good at it, but I'm having fun. Well, <laughs> so. what, what everyone says about mini painting is that you don't have to be good at it. Like you don't have to have any talent. You just have to do it. And the more you do it, you just do it better. Cause it's, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not, it's not that hard. Just practice and practice. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's just like anything. And it's just sort of fun. Like I, I have a little, you're okay. This is great for a podcast audience. I'm showing right. pictures of the little Odeo Shum painting. She's, she's holding up a small miniature figure. It is a yellow yep. shade. It's got a large mouth. We're really painting the picture for the people at home. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> well, it, I, so the Odeo is a creature near and dear to my heart because, yep. um, in <laughs> one of the campaigns I did it, the, the girls had to go into the sewer to try and find um, the secret meeting of cults and okay. how how the sewer system works in this magical setting is Odiosh. Is Explain. every so every so many um I think I made it like every thousand yards or so there was an enclosure okay. that had an Odiosh in it that would basically eat all of the refuse oh and everything gosh. coming down through the sewers. <laughs> So it was like a fully functioning sewer system, like it was. real good city planning. Like, yeah, so that was part of the city planning was yeah. using these magical creatures to process their sewage. That's so, smart. That's smart. Um, they're having to walk by the bars and like dodge tentacles flare, right. flailing out trying to eat them. <laughs> oh like, man, that's awesome. Yeah. So, uh, yep. That these these guys hold a, a near any big city I make. This is what's in the sewers. Just so, throw them GMs, down there. take that. Right. <laughs> take this. Put it on DM's Guild, like the fully functioning sewer system, like for your <laughs> fantasy city. Like, I should. I actually have written a few things that I want to put on DM's Guild at some point. I just yeah. need to make them prettier. I, the thing I have made that I am the proudest of, actually, and since you are a parent, you might appreciate it. Yeah. I did the disgruntled parent background. Okay. This is where you've had enough. Yeah. I, I, it's just you have had enough. You're going out, and you're gonna go on an adventure. <laughs> you require 10 hours of sleep to be fully rested or else you get a point of exhaustion <laughs> like <laughs> oh no no it's parenting so like yeah. parenting teaches you how little sleep right you oh, can so, survive so off now of. you so you're like an elf at this point you can survive on four hours like yep. <laughs> you're just trancing because you're you know your kid might wake up for sure that's yeah awesome. that one was really fun that's awesome know. well we'll Look definitely for that maybe someday on the dms guild i don't know yeah <laughs> yeah you know you should, i mean you should um, well, we'll definitely we'll put all your social media and stuff in the show notes so people can be sure to check that out and um, definitely follow her on Twitter. Lots of lots of great stuff. Definitely fun to engage with. And, you know, hopefully one of these days we'll run into each other. Maybe Game Hole uh, this Game next Hole year. Con. Yeah, you got to make it out there. It's so much fun. I, you know, I'm going to put it on the list. I'm going to drag my family with me and it will be an awesome time. It, it's a family friendly con. So. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> well, Dr. Megan, thank you so much for joining me. It was awesome talking with you um, and best of luck in everything that you're doing with your groups and the girls you're working with and, and you are making a change in the world and it is awesome to see people using this game we love to, you know, positively impact the people around them. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Well, guys, until next time, you know, please make sure that you are being kind to each other, loving each other. Remember, this game is for fun. It's for relationships. Um, there is nothing like the friendships that you build at the table. And, uh, and there's nothing like the friendships you build with other people who play. So make sure that you are getting online. You're getting with groups in and around you that you can connect with, make those friendships. And until next time, just enjoy your games. 